All right, so speaking of building stuff, I am not too proud to admit that when I get a box in the mail that I order and it says some assembly acquired, my heart starts to beat a little faster. And I'm not too proud to admit that I need those instructions. I know a lot of men will be like, nah, just throw those out, let's just get started, right, with my potato and my, my steak, and I'm just going to go for it, right? I'm not too proud to admit I need those instructions, because here's what ends up happening most of the time. I get this thing, I put all this stuff out, and my family knows this all too well, and I either miss a step somewhere, I use the wrong piece, something's missing, this doesn't quite fit, and next thing you know, I got to start the whole thing all over again or at least that step. And it's super annoying and super frustrating. My family like kind of leaves the room when I'm building something because it always goes wrong. So I'm not too proud to admit that. So and I read this text this week and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh my, I couldn't begin to imagine being this team of builders who had to put together this tabernacle with all of these instructions that we'll see all throughout these several chapters. And, and again, because I know from my experience, something always goes wrong. Even if I'm reading the instructions, I'm going through this. This is not just a dresser for the bedroom. This is God's tabernacle. It's a big deal, and it's a big deal to him. So I end up, you know, this is something that I, I couldn't even begin to imagine what that would be like in that situation. And I think that's a little bit kind of how things are for us too, right? We... we skip a step, we end up messing up the build, we end up doing something, and that's kind of an illustration of our lives. Sometimes we tend to just kind of think we can do things without God, and we just kind of go for it, right? And, and, and that's why God gives specific orders and specific instructions in this section that we'll see today. He gives specific instructions on how these things are going to be done. And the reason for that is because he wants us to come to him but he also wants us to have the right attitude, which means that we have to take these seriously enough to like, hey, you know what? I need these instructions. I need to know exactly what he wants from me. And that starts with the attitude and an attitude of worship. And that's where we're hopefully going to see this morning as we pull out this, this, uh, this theme throughout this entire uh, passage. This, um, this theme we're going to talk about this morning, this section actually is kind of that, that one of the final sections of this entire book of Exodus. We're going to be in chapters 25 through 31. And I told the guys on Monday what I want to do this morning is is take this verse by verse. So we're just going to take this for, I'm joking, I'm joking. First, we're not going to do this too much, even for me. All right, so in a couple weeks, we'll we'll see a lot of this same information. And I was looking at this, and and uh, Pastor Pat will be preaching next week, and then I'll pick up the the final chapters. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, it's going to be the same message if I go through every single detail. So what I want to do this morning is hopefully, because this this is like all the instructions for the preparation. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to see it being put together. But what you'll see in the scriptures, particularly in the the five books of Moses, he tends to kind of repeat these things quite frequently. Right? So he'll tell you all these things, and then in a couple chapters later, he'll tell you all of it again as they're putting it together. So I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't want to do the same sermon twice. It'll be a little bit less work for me, but that's not what you pay me for. So I'm trying to figure out, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to pull out some of these principles from this section, and then in a couple weeks, we'll probably go into more detail of what some of these other things mean. So I'm going to pull out some principles and some observations and some illustrations that I think will be useful for us as we kind of go into that in a couple of weeks. So one of those observations is is directly attached to our main idea this morning, which is this, that the faithful worship of God's people begins from the inside out. The faithful worship of God's people begins from the inside out. Now, most of us, I'm sure, when we hear the word worship, the first thing that comes to mind is probably music. It, it's music, but what I think is important for us to understand, and it's not wrong, that's not a wrong assumption. You know, we go to a worship service, you expect to hear music, but what else should we expect to hear? We should be expecting to hear the Word of God. We should be expecting to, to have prayer. We should be expecting, you know, just a time of reflection and meditation and all of those things. And it's also including in, in our lifestyles, and that's hopefully some of the things we'll get out of this today is that there is a style and a lifestyle of worship that's really important for us as well. Darlene Sheck, who is a, uh, uh, she was one of the contributors to a book by Matt Redman, uh, who is a famous uh, writer and song, um, 
a magician. And he, he wrote this book called Inside Out with a bunch of people. It's literally, if you look at it, it says, Matt Redman and Friends. Right? So he wrote this book. Uh, Darlene put these words together as a definition of inside out worship. And it says, devotion that flows from a changed life. It's devotion that flows from a changed life. So that's the whole lifestyle of worship that we'll hopefully see this morning. And this is really neat because it obviously flows so nicely of, of what we've seen these last couple of weeks. Last couple of weeks, we've really touched on this idea of a, of a holy people being called apart and set apart to be holy, right? So now, now what God's doing here in this section and what Moses is, is doing on behalf of the Lord is he's saying, look, I've told you now how to be a people set apart, how to be a, a people and a nation that's holy, and now I'm going to teach you how to worship, right? So in order for you to worship a holy God and be holy, you need to understand how to do that, and that's what we'll see here this morning as well. So on the screen, I'm going to put up a, a, what the tabernacle looks like, and this is kind of a zoomed in, and, and you won't see all the, the labels and things like that, but the labels are there, and, and what we're going to see here, and, and one of the neat things I, I pulled out of this passage this week is when you look at the text, what it does is it kind of starts in the inside, and then it kind of builds outwardly, which is really neat. So of course, it first begins with the collection of all the materials, Right, and the example with the kids a moment ago, that's all the Lego pieces. You have to gather all of those pieces, and then they can start instructing how to build that. But what it does is it starts with the Ark of the Covenant, which is right in that inside, the Holy of Holies. And then following that is the table for the bread, and then it's the lampstand. So you can kind of see where those are placed inside the, the tent. And, and again, that, that Ark of the Covenant is inside the inner, inner portion, what they call the Holy of Holies. And then the bread and lampstand is right outside of that area. And then, it's, and then they start talking about the, the bronze altar, the tabernacle, and the courtyard. And then it goes into detail on the priestly garments. So I saw this, and I was like, this is really neat because it kind of shows this picture of this inside-out instructions starting with that most holy place. And, and Exodus 25.8 puts it this way, and we'll kind of see how all this fits in and why this is important. Uh, and this is kind of, a, I would say, the theme verse of this entire section. Exodus 25.8 says, And let them make me, this is God speaking to Moses, a sanctuary that I might dwell in their midst. So he gathers, he gives these instructions to gather all these materials for the purpose of him being able to dwell in their midst. And what we've seen in this entire book so far, in case you've missed a few weeks, chapters 1 and 2, we saw that the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. And they, they cried out to God in their affliction. And then in chapters 3 and 4, we see that Moses, this unlikely man, Moses, this murderer, was called to be the deliverer of the people of Egypt, which is obviously a picture of what we see in Christ. And then chapters 5 through the first part of chapter 7, uh, Moses and Aaron, they go before Pharaoh and say, please let my people go. And they speak on behalf of God, let my people go. And then the rest of chapter 7, all the way through chapter, most of chapter 15, the Lord brings down plagues. And he brings down these plagues to show, that, that show Pharaoh that he is God and to show the people that he is God. And remember, he used the example of their so-called gods to destroy that entire nation and people. And that section, of course, includes the great story of the crossing of the Red Sea. In the rest of chapter 15 through chapter 18, we see some of these challenges that the people had as they were exiting and finally exiting Egypt. They faced all of these challenges, and God got them through that as well. And then, of course, what we saw in these last couple of weeks, chapters 19 through 24, Israel receives the law from Moses. And, and he, he receives this law and allows people to understand this is how you are to be a nation set apart. So now that the people have an idea of how to be and how to act and how to live, and again, this is really neat because God now, as I stated previously, is saying this is now how you are to worship. And in fact, if you look at the word sanctuary, it actually means a holy place. So when we talk about sanctuary, we're talking about a holy place, a place of worship, a place where the, his holy people can gather. So we see that the purpose of the tabernacle, and this is what we pull right out of chapter 8, 
or uh, verse 8, the purpose of the tabernacle was for the people of God to be in his presence. And of course, the New Testament, the, the application, what we see there comes directly out of Hebrews chapter 8, where it talks about this as a shadow and a copy of Jesus Christ himself. So the second illustration we see, aside from the, the, uh, altar, the, the, the tabernacle we saw a moment ago, the second one is, is actually in, in the materials that they use, uh, this idea of inside-out worship. This, the construction in the materials that they use um, is another illustration we see of this. In chapter 25, again, we see that there's a collection of materials that's needed for the tabernacle's construction, and verses 3 and 4 give us these details. And this is the contribution that you will receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair. Yeah, and goat's hair, and it goes on and on. Um, and, and obviously from that short little snippet, we don't, we don't kind of see it in, in its full uh, story there, but what we don't see and what we understand from, from, the, from the Scripture, it, it, these are valuable materials. These are valuable materials. The yarn is valuable. The, the colors are very purposefully chosen. The materials are specifically chosen. And, and I read this in a commentary this morning about the, the, or this week about the use of materials. It says that the materials for constructing the court will include the precious metals, bronze and silver, which are lesser metals than the pure gold that's described in the inside of the tabernacle, and here's why, since they are farther from the most holy place where the Lord dwells. So the, the pure gold was reserved for the most holy place. The bronze and silver was reserved for the further and further away from the Lord. And I thought that was a great picture. And I think these two illustrations were great pictures of, of what that looks like from the inside out worship perspective and a great illustration for us today. So here's the question, right? What do I need to know today about inside out worship? What do I need to know about inside-out worship? I think the first thing here uh, that we talk about regularly at church here at Thornydale uh, is that worship is not a spectator sport. You have heard that from us probably countless times. And we see that again if we looked at verse 8 again, um, well, we're, we're, it's, it's about him, God, dwelling in our place. Right, And that's what we see there. And what we can learn from that phrasing and that understanding is that when God is dwelling in our midst, that means that we must honor him and respond in a way that honors him. And that's what that means to be in his presence. And that means we are to participate in the acts of worship. And that's the beauty of what we see today is we can participate in those acts of worship unlike the very rigid rules that they had when Moses was writing this. And that worship is not just a corporate worship when we're together as a family of God, but it's also an individual worship that we need to focus on. And we, again, we saw that earlier with the word sanctuary. That means a holy place. It's a place that is holy. And because God is holy, we are also to be holy, if you recall that from a few weeks ago. And that means that we also must be cleansed and clean and pure before God. And we see that in two ways illustrated in this passage. We first see that with the priests. The priests were pure and clean before God. I'll give you a couple of examples from the text. Chapter 29, verse 1. It says, And that now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish. So they, the priests were sp specifically to be consecrated for the service that they were designed to do. Uh, verse, chapter 30, verse 30. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. So the priests in those days, and you'll see all those details in chapter 29 for some light reading a little bit later. Chapter 29, you see all those details that were about the service of, of the tabernacle and the temple. They're about the service of God and they're about the service of the people. That was their role. They, their entire lives was focused in on the service of others. And that's why they needed to be cleansed before God, particularly before they went and before the Lord in his service. They had to be cleansed. In the bronze basin that's located in the, in, the, in the courtyard area, that's what that was used for, and we see those details in chapter 30. 
And they were, that was used and, and made so that way they can cleanse themselves before they entered into the tent for their daily service. And so the, obviously the lesson for us here today is that, that we too must be cleansed before we approach a holy God. And if you recall, we saw that just a couple of weeks ago. And again, this is true for us today because remember Peter himself called us a royal priesthood. Because we should, too, each and every one of us, be about the service of God, about the service of others. And, that, and that's exactly what the priests were doing there as well. And then the next thing that we see an example of this is, is in the place and the instruments of worship. In the place and instruments of worship, they were also consecrated before God. In chapter 30, verses 22 to 25, we see that there's an anointing oil and there was incense that was made for this purpose. And, and, and we, we read these words in 26 through 29. With it you shall anoint the tent of the meeting and the ark of the testimony and the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin for it and its stand. You shall consecrate them that they may be most or made most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. So he has even gone as far to say that everything that's used for the purpose of worship and for the purpose of this is to be consecrated and made holy as well. Everything was used, everything that was used was made and supposed to be cleansed before the God, our Father. So uh, I was thinking about this. My parents, when they had their home built in California, uh, before everything was finished, I remember them telling us that on the drywall, they wrote Bible verses on their drywall, and they prayed over their home before it was done. Like, in a way, they were saying, this, this is going to be your house. This is going to be a place where we can honor you. And I thought that was really neat. And they were dedicating and consecrating that home, in a sense, before God. And one of the things that you probably don't see each week, a few of us see this, but the worship team, uh, when they practice every single week, before they start, they pray. And a lot of times what we hear from the prayer is, is that the Lord would, would bless all of the details. And it's not a superficial, God, I hope nothing goes wrong. It's more like, God, I don't want anything to happen that's going to take the attention off of you. I don't want anything to distract any of you from being able to worship a holy God. And that's the prayer. That's the reason for that. It's, it's the dedication of that time for him and that if anything goes wrong, it doesn't take the attention off of him. And you see, so everybody here is, is set apart, and it takes part in the entire act of worship, and it's a participatory time for each and every one of us. Next thing we see here is that we all contribute to worship. We all contribute to worship. And I think this is really neat. We see this in, in really three different ways in this text. First way we see it is financially. Yeah, we can head right back to chapter 25 with the opening verses there. We see that uh, starting in verse 1, that the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they may take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And that this is the contribution you receive from them. We saw this a moment ago. Gold and silver and bronze, blue and purple, scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skin, acacia wood, oil from the light lamps, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastplate, and, make, and let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell in their midst." And here's a really neat part. Exactly how, as I show you, concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. We'll touch on that verse a little bit later, but you see that there's a very specific design and purpose made here. And I think the key goes back to verse 2, where the contribution comes from everybody whose heart has caused them to do so. God's not body slamming them and, 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 and holding them in submission. He's, he's allowing their hearts to move. And that's, again, why it's so important that we saw in the last couple of weeks where the heart of the man needs to be changed and be made holy so they can worship in a way that's pleasing to him. That's that inside-out worship mentality that we're talking about. It's a voluntary contribution from those hearts that have been changed. 
So let's face it, obviously we know that God could have created this with everything he had without needing anything from his people, but he allowed his people to take part in that. And I love that about our Lord. I love that about him, that he allows us to take part in these things. He allows us to take part in changing people's lives. He allows us to take part in ministering to their needs. And I love that about him. Another example uh, we see later on in chapter 30 is he does institute a tax. He institutes a tax that allows the financial operations basically to keep moving. And that was an important thing. And then they also contributed to worship in this other way, and it was functionally. Functionally, he allowed them to take part in this worship. Chapter 27, I'll read a couple verses from there, verses 20 and 21. He says, say that you shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn. In the tent of meeting outside of the veil that is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend to it from evening to morning before the Lord. And it shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout the generations by the people of Israel." So again, they're, they're, they're able to contribute, and they have contributed this oil and this, uh, and this to, to use for this light that was to be burning continuously. And of course, if you think about this idea of light, we should hopefully be reminded of, of Jesus as the light of this world. And then later on, he says that you, my disciples, are the light of this world. And that's what we're called to be, so it's a picture of that, what we'll see probably in a couple of weeks. And this is really, if you think about just being a, a part of the, the functional contributions, it's no different than some of you who, who bring food for us to enjoy every single week outside of the service. That, that, that's a functional thing that you take part of every single week. And then the third thing that takes that just a step further is this idea of service. That's another way that they contribute. Chapter 31, verses 1 through 6 reads this way. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezael, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Holy Spirit, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for the setting, and in carving wood, to, every, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Oholiab, the son of Esamach, of the tribe of Dan. Now I have all those names, and then you just throw in Dan. And I have given all the able men ability that they have made, that they may make all that I have commanded to you. I love this. Just, there just so happened to be, conveniently, these very skilled men who had these skills to be able to build and to design artistically these objects. And I love that there's two real big observations. One, you see here that the Lord empowered them with the Holy Spirit. The Lord empowered them with the Holy Spirit to be able to do these things, gave them the skill and the ability and the knowledge and the craftsmanship to be able to do this. And then the other thing we see is that they, they were given a team, a team of able men to be able to do this task. Last year we did a, a sermon series in Proverbs. And uh, I think it was Pastor Pat's sermon, he made this observation on the Hebrew word for wisdom, which was really neat connection, and the same word is used here, but it's closer related to this idea of skill and the use of that skill, right? It's great to have this skill, but if you're not using it in the way to benefit others, that's not true wisdom. And I love that illustration, that idea that God gives us wisdom, but through that wisdom, it's, it's the use of the skills that he has given us. So we see here that wise men were tasked and given the ability to create everything needed for this special build. And then lastly, we learn this. We learn that inside worship means that we worship a God of order and purpose. Order and purpose, and we saw that back in verse 9. But if we were to go through all of the items that were described as this entire section, you'll see that there was precise measurements there are specific materials, and they were all used for a specific purpose. There was nothing left over. There were none of those extra parts in that little bag. You're like, I hope these are extra parts. Nothing was left unturned. And there's really two. I, I, I'll give you a couple of examples of what we see in the detail that God uses in this 
section, uh, chapter 25, verses 23 to 28. These are all the instructions on the showbread table. And it's incredible the detail that we see here. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 23, you shall make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits should be its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it. And you shall make a rim around it with a handbreadth wide and a molding of gold around the rim. And you shall make it for four rings of gold and fasten it to the rings of the four corners at its four legs. Close to the frame... The ring shall lie as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and the table shall be carried with these. And you shall make its plates, its dishes, for instance, and its flagons and its bowls with which to pour drink offerings. And you shall make them of pure gold. And you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me regularly. Very detailed, very specific design. And here's another example of the lampstand in verses 31 and 36 of the same chapter. You shall make me a lampstand of pure gold. And this lampstand is is what we probably know today as the menorah. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches that go out from the sides, three branches of the lampstand, one out of one side, and out of it three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Right, you can kind of get the picture there. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with one with calyx and flower on one branch. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and a flower on the other branch. So for that the six branches going out from the lampstand, and the lampstand itself shall be for four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyx. We we can go on and on, right? But so detailed. So precise, and the picture you see from it, there's tons of illustrations you can look up online that show you exactly what this looked like, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful, and it's detailed. And again, those are just a couple of examples that that help us to see that these, it wasn't just a haphazard, make me a candle, make me a table. He said, I need it to be designed in a specific way. And what that does is it helps us to remember that God is a God of order, Monday morning, we're talking with the guys, and, and one of the things we pointed out that always comes to mind is this entire idea of, of creation and this idea of, 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 the, of the word cosmos. And, and it, it always goes back to this idea of, of order. It always goes back to this idea of order. God created order in his creation. It wasn't this accident. It wasn't this big bang. It wasn't something that just happened to happen. God created specifically to create order, not chaos. And that's unfortunately what the world teaches us. They teach us the opposite. They teach us about chaos instead of order and a created God who created this universe. So we've seen this morning that a faithful worship of God's people begins from the inside out. The faithful worship of God's people begins from the inside out. Because you see a a heart that's unchanged they won't participate in worship. They're not going to contribute to the, the, the worship service or the, the act of worship. And a, at an unchanged heart will not care to worship a God of purpose and a God of order. So we need to have that idea of, of an inside-out change of heart in order to do that. So that's the problem that we need to solve next. How do I change from the inside out? How do I change from the inside out? So the first thing is we need to begin by cleansing our heart. We need to begin by cleansing our heart. So I I preached uh, in the Proverbs last year, and there was a section in chapter 4 that we touched on. And the whole idea of that and the whole purpose of that was guarding your heart. And here are the key verses from that, uh, that proverb. It comes from 23 through 26, and it reads this way. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure. What We see this idea of keep, and that idea of keep means to protect and to guard your heart. And that's where that idea of guarding your heart came from. 
that idea of keep is, is to protect and to guard your heart. And, and what Solomon does, the writer of that proverb, what he does there is he's saying that we do that by following the path that God had put before us. We have to follow that path that God had put before us. And, then, and what we know is that when we search the scriptures, that's where we understand that path. We understand that path from the truth of God that's found in the word of God. Second thing we need to do is we need to cleanse our mind. Cleanse our heart, then we need to cleanse our mind. And this really can come in, in a number of ways. But I think the, the first thing that we need to understand is that our mind should always be focused on him. Our mind should always be focused on the work of the Father through his Son and through the work of the Holy Spirit. And if our minds aren't focused on him, then it's going to be hard to do that. Paul said it in Colossians chapter 3 in the first couple verses. He says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. When we're setting our minds on the things above, the things on the earth, most of the time is much easier to handle because we know that this is not it. We have so much more to look forward to. And because the world can be attractive, sometimes we have the tendency to lose focus on the things that are above and those things that are unseen. But Paul's words are very wise because it says here that, it, more or less it says in so many words that when whatever our minds are focused on is generally the things that we chase after. Those are the things that we chase after. Those are the things that we think and the things that we say my mother always used to tell me, think before you speak. That's why. Because sometimes when we have things in our mind, we end up doing things that we shouldn't or saying things that we shouldn't. And that's why we need to focus and cleanse our minds there. And then finally, we need to have an attitude of worship. A friend of mine recently had a, a pretty rough week and a pretty rough day. And uh, they had posted on their social media at some point that there was, there was uh, after a really long day, sitting in their backyard, and it was one of those nice days, which they're like, you know, Wednesday was a great day, Tuesday not so much, right, this week. And, and looking outside, and, and the sun was setting, and it was just an absolute beautiful thing, right? I, I like to call it God's canvas. And, and it was just one of those beautiful days, and that person was like, okay, you're still there, God. It's been dark, it's been ugly, but there's your light, I see you. I see you tapping on my shoulder. I know you're still there. And we need those gentle reminders sometimes. The world is dark, but we're called to be light because Jesus is light. So I want to close this morning by reading uh, a paraphrase from the message translation. And it's from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And it's going to be on the screen. It'll be kind of hard to, there's, it, it's, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of words but just go ahead and listen if you can't follow along on the screen. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God has done for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't, be well, don't become well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-informed, well-formed maturity in you. So my question to you is, will you do that? Will you place your life before God? Will you fix your attention on God? Will you ask God, the Lord, to change you from the inside out? Let's pray. Father, it's not easy to be changed from the inside out, particularly when maybe we've had a hard, hard life Maybe there's a lot of stuff going on in our current life and in our, our world right now as we speak. 
Maybe, maybe we're hurting inside and nobody even knows about it. Maybe we're struggling to get by each day. So help us, Father, to lay all that to your feet. Help us to lay all that before you. Help us to, to fix our eyes on your promises. Because really, God, that's, that's, that's what we're able to do. That's the, the, you control all things. So when we recognize that and we, we give that to you and we put that before you, Father, we could still rejoice even when it's dark outside, even when it's difficult. And in those times where it's most difficult, we can remember who you are and what you've done and what you've promised for us. So help us to do that now. If we're struggling, if somebody in this room is struggling, Father, I ask that you just speak to them, that you help them to see who you are, what you have done, what you're planning for them in your life. Reveal to them their purpose and let them to look forward, Father, to what you have promised. And give them that joy that they may be lacking in this very moment. I ask these things, God, in Jesus' name.